If you would have time to, to um, feed back, that would be great. So, um, charging. Could we either have Jenny or somebody from Jenny's group wanting to feed back top messages, top points, mm. top actions? Mm. Sorry, oh, there's Jenny. Mm. Oh, Jenny's just coming into the room. Jenny, are you able to feed back on kind of top messages, actions from your workshop on, on charging this morning? Um, okay, um, there's a handout with some basic information for, for people to um, know the basics about charging. I was mentioning about how um, people are essentially being charged three times because social care is um, funded through general taxation, council tax and um, charges to individuals. Charging is discretionary. Um, local authorities don't have to charge. Um, and we went through um, some of the, the issues that people were having. Um, it's uh, essentially about how people don't necessarily, aren't able to represent themselves um, particularly well because of lack of training of um, finance officers, lack of being given the right information and support to identify disability related expenses, um, not knowing um, to refer uh, finance officers back to section eight of the um, uh, Care Act statutory guidance, the key principles there, which include um, leaving people with enough money for social inclusion and well-being. Um, but also one of the, the a really fantastic recommendation came out um, which was to, to compile a list of um, disability related expenditure. So what people had had as, as allowed as disability related expenditure and in what circumstances to build up a, um, a crowd shared resource that people can then look at and say, well, okay, if that person's been able to use, um, to have that allowed in that, that circumstance, that's something that I can also um, uh, suggest as a disability related expense. So, yeah, it's a fantastic, practical, tangible action that we love. Um, great. Um, next, um, hourly rates and recruiting PAs. Eleanor, Robert, or. Uh, basically, we, uh, we, we had a very small enthusiastic group who, who spoke about the problem. Basically, the problems of recruiting and, and based on the hourly rates, how how can we recruit and re keep our staff? And there were some really some stories about what really happens, how it's hard basically to keep a relationship going with your peers if, if they are. If they're really worried about their jobs and you're wondering why they didn't build a relationship, and so that was the uh, yeah, what we we were talking about was basically getting a space and time to allow people to to develop the the ideas of how you do this and that kind of thing. I don't know if you think yeah, I mean, some of the barriers that people talked about was, for example, uh, local authorities not being prepared to make an increase to your direct payment when the national minimum wage goes up, or for pensions. In Northamptonshire, actually, the uh, local, the county council there, it's covering the pension. That wouldn't care if money county council at the moment. Hmm? You've got county council running at the moment. <laughs> well, one good thing that Northamptonshire has done is they're covering the um, the cost of pensions, but that is tied to using the in-house payroll service. Oh, wow. um, yeah, recruitment, lots of people are having different kinds of, of problems there, whether it's lack of interest from people or too many unsuitable applications coming from people because the job centre's told them that they'll be sanctioned if they don't apply. Yeah. Um, so people are either finding they've got no one to cover the hours that they're actually getting mm -hmm. funded for or having too many applications. And then in terms of solutions, people were talking about the need to create a broader understanding of what personal assistance actually is and for it to become 
for it to be profiled as a valuable profession. The main points. We'll type up our workshop. I would say it's worth, worth fund, fundraising. In the, in the country at the moment, you can say to you on the record. Yeah, I know there are problems in Northampton. Yeah. <laughs> and I come from that area. Birmingham, Birmingham, uh... <laughs> Not a worse last week, it's been a couple of worse than a year. Thanks, Robert and Ellen. Um, um, next workshop is uh, Mark and my workshop on um, assessment and reviews. Yeah. Mark, do you want to kick off? Yeah. Or I've, I've got some notes here. Yeah. You want to? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, we, I think we've spent, uh, both Ellen and Mark touched on the horrendous range of, of really appalling practice in terms of assessment and reviews. So in terms of solutions, there was a number of really kind of clear um, ideas. Firstly, it's about absolutely, if we're going to be lobbying for any kind of independent living service framework set of policies, that then we want stat we want it to become a statutory duty to fund DDPOs to provide independent advice and advocacy, um, so that that funding is is secure and we can start getting the support we need to go through these processes. That was one key thing. Another key thing was how do we build our peer support, the support that we offer each other, whether that's skill sharing knowledge sharing, experience sharing, and that could be physically getting together a kind of peer support group, it could be online, it could be resources, um, so there's more work to be done there, and that definitely did echo what came out of the National People Disabled People Summit a couple of weeks ago. There's also about developing our own definition of independent living, or being really clear about how we communicate that so it's not bastardised and turned upside down as it is currently being um, being interpreted by um, kind of government policy. So how how do we how do we create a compelling uh, description and definition of independent living that can you know uh, create allies and, and advocates? And there's something about just developing our resources um, about our rights because knowing our rights is absolutely key as well. Can I say we've also said in that one about um, we should redesign the you know the anti discrimination act. Redesign the anti. Restart again with that. Right. Do our own one. Then put it. I don't know what people feel about that. Yeah. Starting from scratch again. It's definitely got holes in it and it doesn't address kind of independent exactly. living and lots of it's not enforceable. So I think we definitely have to learn from the Equality Act if we're going to be lobbying for independent living legislation. Okay. Um, so should we move on to the um, afternoon workshops and then we can just have a quick um, a kind of a plenary discussion or comments or observations. So, um, okay, can we um, go with alternative models of independent living, please, facilitated by Steve? Um, yeah, well, Alan might actually also give better feedback than me because I was taking notes and I was just giving the presentation. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, basically, like, um, it was primarily about um, the cooperative models um, of employment care that exist in countries like Sweden and Norway and the potential applicability of something like that to the UK. Um, and I think there were various different viewpoints on that. I think some people probably felt that anything other than individuals directly employing their PAs could have a loss of choice and control. Um, there was also some discussion of the local and national scale, uh, and I think um, there was a suggestion also that a national body that employs all PAs um, could, be, um, could be an option. Um, and sort of how, how the role of the, of the, the co-ops in Sweden and Norway is similar and different to that of um, centres for independent living and other DPOs. Um, Ellen, do you want to add anything? Um, I think I think people had 
I think the thing that people are saying is that you need funding, whatever model you have, the funding has to be in place, and that's the priority and what is needed. Um, how what, what they could provide is um, options for people who don't want to have to carry all the responsibilities of employing someone. So that's and the administrative burden and the keeping up with legislation. So I think there was interest in exploring different models that could take over those responsibilities for people and reduce the risk. Um, also uh, help with recruitment, um, because the co-op model, you'd have a pool of, of PAs, uh, whereas individuals are finding it difficult to recruit. So I think people are interested in continuing to look at different options for managing direct payments, but the priority for everyone is to fight for funding. Um, I've heard of someone getting more funding from local authority. Sorry. I've heard of someone getting more funding from um, local uh, the local authority concerned by forming an agency rather than a co-op. Um, this was one person. <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether the other employees existed, but he got he got more money from the local authority, a lot more. Interesting. I mean, I guess we're at some point we're going to have to pin down how we take these discussions forward because we can't wait for next year's conference. So it might be about setting up a small working group to kind of develop the ideas that come out of today. Um, okay, next one, independent living support principles. Michelle, Michelle yeah. Albert was looking at the independent living principle. So we first got a conversation about what's not working, mm -hmm. and then we looked at the Australian model, um, which Sarah gave a, a brief presentation on, and I won't try and elaborate on that, I might not do it. So we looked at that, um, the independent living is beyond social care, and we also looked at so I looked at things around planning assessments. We drew on the other um, assessment we looked at the other one. And we also um, had a discussion around the need to look at um, intersectionality of say people within the whole thing around um, um, independent living principles. People told me if I'm missing some of it. As well as we sorry. So we also looked at another thing that was really important, which is around language. Um, we need to have some consistency around languages mm -hmm. and, um, and, and being clear about where we use PA and where we use carers. And, mm -hmm. and there was another point that was made around looking at maybe independent living and make, I think it was around would we use um, equal rather than equal rather than independent living. So you know, trying to make people think about independent living is for everybody. And we also had a discussion around getting independent living out there so it's not just among us lot within these rooms. So <laughs> it should be something that everybody's aware of, everybody's aware that it's all right for people to value it as well. Um, also making sure that there's a decent way for people to assist, assist us, which would be our PAs. Oh yeah, um, there, yeah, and also another point was around, around making sure we think about the assessment process. One of the things around the assessment process, lots of resources have been drained into the assessments. So thinking around assessments around people taking a lead in that, disabled people being the drivers of that, rather than it being driven by um, professional bodies where you have all these um, different in, in, um, people employed just to carry assessment, which may not even be worth fifty pounds at the end of the at the end of it. Um, so that was a bit. Is that it? Um, so overall, what we're saying is draw around the principles that are there, um, making sure to take people value and making sure we think about independent living outside of these people. And making sure our life is own, you know, we take away from Sorry, thanks Michelle. Um, funny enough, we kind of came up with some similar conclusions in the uh, campaigning for a right to independent living. Um, one of them was absolutely about um, engaging with our people and, and further mobilising um, disabled people, particularly disabled people that are locked away and shut up. Um, and linked to that is the need to, to communicate independent living. So it's back to this 
if we were in a lift for five minutes with the Prime Minister, how would we, how would we, <laughs> we'll do that, we'll be there. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you how, would we, how would we communicate, what's the pitch for independent uh, living, and we need to come up with something really I think I've got a better idea, mate. Because <laughs> there's a load that somebody made the point in our, in our workshop. There's loads of jargon. We have our own jargon. We talk about the 12 pillars. Most people out there will think we're talking about a building. You know, they, so we have to be really clear and, and compelling in how we describe independent living, but also PAs. You know, there's so... The role of PAs, the model of PAs from a, from a social model. Um, so there's a lot of work there. We actually thought we probably should then develop a, a communication strategy and then think about how we implement it. And there was an idea that maybe we need to you know, have a, a hub, whether that's us in this room probably, where we can kind of you know, implement that strategy have really communicate our messages and our arguments, share the stats, share the evidence, build that evidence, um, so we're the most effective communicators and champions of, of independent living. Um, there was also, we also then need to kind of sign up so that all of our networks that we're engaged in, whatever partic particular, you know, um, pet subject or issue, we're all signed up to promoting and lobbying on independent living as well. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, then on that point, there's about building alliances, whether that's social workers who are sick to the back teeth of, of implementing this, this gatekeeping service, whether it's other advice agencies, we need to keep building those alliances. And then we need to be doing some really concerted lobbying. So in London, we've got the local elections. We need to be really... Um, out there with some clear ask around independent living. There's 90 MPs now who've signed up requesting a cross-party um, commission on social care. Um, we need to be speaking with them and influencing them. Um, so there's lots and lots to do from a kind of lobbying um, and um, kind of democratic process point of view as well. I just want to say something really about communications because I think while we do need to have our own definition of independent living, if we're going to try and engage the general population and maybe ask them to pay more taxation, which we discussed, we've got to make it understandable to them. And I think a lot of our jargon isn't understandable to the general public. Yeah, totally agree. I think that was a clear kind of message of today because that came out of the, the workshop that I was in in the morning and the afternoon. Somebody right at the back there? Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, following on from that point, I was in the discussion, uh, I can't remember the but it was in the green room, um, and I think the issue of making is something that the general public is aware of is so, so important. Yeah. And I think it will be interesting to look at different ways of communicating that information. For example, like just off the top of my head, some of will make a bunch of documentaries. If you were to take the day-to-day the -day life of a person that has all of the cuts and etc. kind of imposed on them, and you were to say, take a social experiment and put an able-bodied person through the process mm -hmm. of having their life scrutinised, having themselves making them have to justify what they do on a day-to-day -day basis and completely flipping that around and making it something that is accessible, that people understand. If you wanna, if I leave my house <coughs> in the morning and I say, I'm gonna go to London today and I change my mind last minute, I can go from taking the train to the bus to whatever, a tram, and I don't have to justify that decision to anybody. I saw a lady at my local station try and get on the train and somebody said to her, well, did you phone ahead? in advance, and that's outrageous, absolutely outrageous. And I think taking normal, not normal, but taking that, an average day of uh, a disabled person and having a, a series of non-disabled people going through that and letting people see what is it like 
what is, I mean, you're fighting for independent living, you're fighting for the rights to live your lives as, as you like. Mm -hmm. It's not, it shouldn't be a battle, we shouldn't be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think if more people knew, you would find the, the same mobilization that you get around, say, the LGBTQ uh, community, where you'll look at rallies and there will be people who fall underneath that barrier, but, uh, sorry, that umbrella, but you'll also find, you know, people who are not, who still believe in the issues. You know, it's, it's not an, an issue of disabled people, it's an issue of people. It's a human rights issue. I feel like if we were to unify and make it something that's accessible, walk through this, live this, you will find that we can out and campaigning. It's wrong. It's really, really wrong. So that's my 20 cents. <laughs> I think one of the things in our group was it, it's getting increasingly hard to be able to communicate what exactly you're talking about, the right to be spontaneous, you know, too often now we're getting a narrow, narrow narrative, it's about functional stuff like can you go to the loo, or, have you had a hot meal today, and we've got to kind of absolutely challenge that and say this is about, you know, we only live once, and we should be exactly quality of life, and that is spontaneity. Mark. 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 That makes it sometimes. Because you can have your coke on. So definitely, Mark, I'll come to you. Oh. I said it's, it's basic. Hang on. So you the coke or not. Daphne or Mark. Yeah, Daphne or Mark, Mark, which... Well, I... I have to do my Julie diary. I'm going to do my Julie diary. I found it very hard. No. What to write? He thought he had to justify all his days. No. Every hour of every day. And that's what independent Yeah, I think it's terrible when people have got to uh, justify why they need to have their coat on. Yes. But I'm getting to the stage that I've got to do that with my current PA. And while I've got this uh, microphone, I'm going to say, I think <laughs> that right at the beginning, right at the beginning, and I'm talking about in the 1990s now, we should, instead of accepting the Watered Down Disability Act in 1995, before that we should have gone on and, uh, and pressed and pressed for um, full civil rights. Maybe if we did that, we wouldn't be sitting here, here, yeah. going, going over old ground, going backwards and trying to come forwards again. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Michael and Carla? Yeah. yeah. Well, I'd say, adding on to that, we should be denying it ourselves, the existing one, and filling the gaps where, we, where the holes are, and then present it to the government. Just to remind people, I'm not preaching, but uh, you expressed yourself, Daphne, but we did in the 1990s, and it was called Dan. And we need to get out there and do it again, and we need to try and make sure it's wider. We get the message out, and it's not always the same people doing it. The thing is, what we see now, and what's, what it's been mounting up to, is an effective form of social apartheid. It's everything that we've been talking about. But when it boils down to it, it is actually social apartheid. And that's what we actively need to resist, be it with information, be it with training, be it with skill sharing, 
not everybody can get out on the streets. I, I understand that. But we need to be a lot more forceful in the whole gamut of everything that we do. Just, we're coming to the last few minutes of the conference now. We're just kind of building on that. I think we really need to take part about, you know, what we've done as a movement in the last seven years to challenge. We've had some real successes. We've mobilised. We are sharing. We're, we are upskilling ourselves. And it's about building on that. And I think, you know, we should be really kind of confident that, that we can do that. And... And when I'm talking about we, it's only going to be us. And probably we're one of the cores in this room. And we need to be going out and engaging more disabled people um, in the movement and in our actions. I'd just like, I'd just like to, to finish by saying, please remember we're just ordinary people trying to live ordinary lives. We'll have to do <coughs> extraordinary things to do it. And then you can be the powerhouse. So what, what, what the idea is, and it'll be good just to check if this is okay with everyone, is we've got a lot of information coming out of today, and I think there's quite a lot of common themes, but what we will do is write those up and then send out to you all what we think are the, the kind of the key campaign objectives and actions and ask if... That, that's your understanding and you're happy to sign up to them. But also, just also, then we need your suggestions about how we actually then make that happen. Because we all need to, we all need to own this. If we're signing up to something and agreeing it, we need to own it and we need to think about how can we each play a part in, in making that happen. So when we're here next year, you know, we've, we've just pushed the whole agenda forward again. So... I think they'll be we'll be sending that out, and then the invite will be tell us how you can make this happen where Easy. you are. Easy. Can you put it on the website, DPAC website? And then we, I'm, on. I'm sure that that DPAC are looking at the yeah, yeah. 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 one. You'll be all in one place. To people we do one. Yeah. yeah, I'm just responding to Mark's question. When by? Uh, <laughs> I think realistically to type up all the notes from today because we've also got the National Disabled People's Summit to write up as well. So we're probably looking at January, but we will send that out. We will circulate it to everyone here. It will be on the Rafa website, the DPAC website, the Inclusion London mm. website, and all the organisations who are represented here today. It will be jointly owned. Great. Okay. Um, any final positive uh, contributions to end the event with? Oh, man. Oh, man. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, collate this, send this to YouTube, and then, yeah, see. Ya. But yeah, please, in the meantime, keep sharing. Very uh, important conference. Okay, this will be Occupy London and Occupy News Network. Peace out.